When the sun lowers toward the horizon and the sky turns black. When lines blur and things are not exactly what they seem. When the normal makes way for the strange and unexplained. It's time to question what is natural and what lies beyond our understanding. It's time to enter the edge of the unknown with your host, Mark Henry. Good evening, ladies and gents. Thanks for joining me here on the Edge of the Unknown. My name is Mark, coming at you every Sunday evening from 8 to 10 Eastern, bringing you the best in paranormal talk, as I am want to do each and every week. We've got a great show coming up for you guys this evening, so hopefully everybody is enjoying the nice weather that we here are in the Northeast. And again, last week I know I was talking, we were laughing with uh, with my guest, Dr. Larry Burke, about me having to kind of hit the cough button uh, a bunch of times. Hopefully we've got that wrangled and taken care of because we're going to move forward tonight without any problems. Finally getting some of the stuff that I need. And as I sit here in my outdoor studio with Lance the Paranormal Pup, checking out the perimeter, I am still seeing the dogwood flying. And for strangely enough, it's not bothering me. So hopefully we're going to get that stuff out of my system. But I tell you what, boy, it's nice to breathe again. And um, I, I'm really excited to have this show because I know we will be off for next week as most of us will be celebrating uh, Father's Day. Obviously, some of us will not be, but I uh, normally try not to have a show on holidays like that because I know people are out and about with families and enjoying that sort of thing. So we will be back after that. And oh my gosh, we are going to be into July and a whole bunch of fun stuff is coming up for this summer. Always check out the website, theedgeoftheunknown.com, for guests and other things that are happening in and around town. That is your one-stop shop for things that are happening. Now, the funny thing is, is we're talking UFOs tonight, and our local chapter of MUFON actually gets together every, I want to say second Sunday, must be, because it was yesterday, and uh, I've never been to the MUFON. I've had the guys on. I've had them in person. I had them in studio back on ECK days. And I've never been to one of their breakfasts where they get together and talk about what's happening in the, in the world of MUFON here in the western New York area. But I did mention that my guest tonight is going to be on. So hopefully some of those guys are out in the listening audience and hopefully maybe will chime in with some of their thoughts and other things that they uh would like to bring to the table as we discuss what we are going to this evening. As always, your thoughts and opinions are welcome. We would love to hear from you throughout the evening as we take you up until 10. The Edge of the Unknown at gmail.com is the email address. Of course, the live chat room at the website is always there for you as well. And the phone lines are open 716 218 3557. That's 716 218 3557. We would love to hear from you. My guest tonight is an upstate New York resident and a New York native. Nice to have somebody from the from the neighborhood on once in a while. <laughs> so we're glad to be back here in the Northeast. She saw her first UFO, UFO at age 12 and is a veteran of the Air Force and the Navy. Cheryl Costa is a retired information security professional from the aerospace industry and for the past five years has been putting together a UFO column for the SyracuseNewTimes.com called New York Skies. She's been a speaker at the International UFO Congress and the MUFON Symposium, and in 2017, with her co-author Linda Miller, released UFO Sightings Desk Reference, United States of America, 21, to, 2001 to 2015. Now, this is a little bit different from a lot of the UFO books out there, if you have not seen it. It is full of data and analysis for 121,000 United States sightings of UFOs reported by individuals in the first 15 years of this 21st century. Cheryl has been named Researcher of the Year at the 2018 International UFO Congress, and she is goodly enough to hang out with us here on the Edge of the Unknown. Cheryl, thank you so much for taking some time out. I know you've been busy. It's awesome to have you here on the Edge of the Unknown. Mark, thank you for having me. I was looking forward to coming on this show. So, as I just mentioned, you've, you've been working at symposiums or speaking at symposiums, 
uh, different parts of the earth, different organizations. Right before we came on, you mentioned you were just at a conference. Tell us a little bit about what you've been up to in just the past couple of days. Well, in New York State, there's been a conference going for, uh, I'm going to, the word they tell me is there's been two different, fa- uh, I'm going to say it this way. There are two different versions of this conference or fest- festival, they call it, um, over the years. But it's a place called Pine Bush, New York. It's down in Ulster County. Okay, that's down on the Hudson. And back in the 80, uh, 70s and 80s, they had an awful lot of triangle uh, and boomerang type things. Five and 10,000 people saw this stuff, and it was quite, a, quite an amazing flap. And since that time, we've had a, a UFO festival yearly. And uh, uh, I, amazingly enough, I was in consideration for speaking this year. <laughs> and left hand didn't know what the right hand was doing, apparently. And it was done. some of it was done with volunteers. And I got dumped. They said, well, well, we'll have you back. We'll have you next year. Okay, fine, great. You know, And that was supposed to be for the uh, Pine Bush. It's supposed to be on the, the 19th of May. On the 15th of May, we had that big storm came across the Midwest a couple of weeks ago. Mm-hmm. And when it got to the Hudson Valley, they had tornadoes touched down out there and it took out the electrical infrastructure there in the town of Crawford. Okay, which is where Pine Bush is. Sure. And, and they were dead. They were down. And, and uh, they canceled. They didn't cancel. They postponed the, the festival, UFO festival until the 9th of June. So about a week later, I get a phone call from the uh, uh, coordinator for it. He said, well, when we postponed it, people who were coming to speak, the UFO experts we had coming to speak, uh, suddenly their, their schedules are all packed up and, you know, that type of thing. They weren't available. Some of them weren't available. Mm-hmm. And she pleaded with me to come down and um, talk at their festival. Plus, uh, there was a situation where the guy who was I was kind of going to be filling in for was also supposed to MC, and I said, "Well, hey, I used to, I'm a certified Toastmaster, so I can MC." And she said, "Would you please?" You know, so we went to Pinebush. We drove down there for Friday night. It was about four four and a half hour drive for us, and uh, I'll tell you, it was an absolute blast. It's a street festival. It looks like a, it looks like a, a farmer's market downtown. Uh, couple of blocks worth of street all blocked off by the cops and they got you know vendors out there intense things uh they have a paranormal museum there paranormal ufo museum uh it's really quite good and um the food was excellent the 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 vendor stuff was uh, quite excellent and then they had a tent going uh, about down by the museum and people who were going to be speaking later in what they call the after festival event. It was like a, about a five hour thing and, and they would do it over to the county courthouse, just a couple blocks away. Okay. And uh, there were going to be four speakers and yay, verily I was one of them and I was the MC. And it was, like I said, we had a wonderful time and the hotel we were in was this place called the Harvest Inn. And it was a couple, oh, I, I would say five blocks from where all the action was taking place. And across the street was your classic trolley car diner. Okay, the silver diner kind of place, right? And it's named the Cup and Saucer. <laughs> they had a Perfect. big UFO beaming a cup of coffee, beaming down into a cup of coffee. And they had these really, really uh, uh, slick T-shirts. And the food there was absolutely, we had a total of four meals there. And every single one of those meals was scrumptious. And so I can't I can't recommend it enough. If, if you want to go to the Pine Bush Festival, if you're in New York or northern Pennsylvania, I recommend you do it next year. And I strongly recommend you go have a meal at the Cup and Saucer because it's terrific stuff. What's it like being a presenter and a speaker versus someone who I'm sure has been to a festival is just, you know, going for your own enjoyment? Well, OK, uh, during the daytime, it was they have a parade, and then they also had the the, the, the street festival. Uh, we didn't get to see the parade. But, uh, the uh, the fest street festival it was, it was like going to a farmer's market, except you know some stuff out. A majority of the stuff out there was either UFO books. Uh, Linda Zimmerman uh, was there selling her books, and she sells books not only in UFOs, but she's a ghost hunter, and she had all that kind of stuff out there. And then uh, there's uh, it's like farmers market, 
Okay, I mean, there was a, we literally at one end of it, they there were people were there selling bread and vegetables. We bought this big piece of cured sausage, you know. Uh, so there's a little bit of everything. We got a few T-shirts, got a few weird uh, um, uh, gray gray alien apparatus to wear on our heads of one sort or another. And uh, like I said, we just had a wonderful time meeting people. And of course, I'm press. You know, because I'm, I'm a journalist. So I threw my press passes on. I was walking around with my cell phone. I was interviewing people to, to kind of support an article I was going to write here for my editor. And uh, I just had a qualified blast. Now, do a lot of the people go just for that kind of the fun stuff? And I certainly would knock that. But do, what, what, I mean, again, not using ratios because you are a statistical person. But who would you say is there for the fun and, and the frolicking and then, those people who are there to actually hear the speakers and get down to okay. some serious stuff. Yeah. Okay. Um, the people who were street vendors tell me they typically draw and they did draw a huge crowd. Uh, they draw between six and 7,000 people come for the uh, parade and the festival itself, the street festival itself. Okay. But the after hours event was held in a courthouse room that can only sit about 150 people. Mm. And that's the serious talk that we had. Uh, we had a guy who was an expert who was actually abducted. We had one of those guys. We had a lady who was up on all of the uh, the latest, uh, what I'm going to call the uh, the consciousness aspects of this stuff. I was there doing statistics, uh, talking about statistics, and we had a qualified astro- uh, a PhD astronomer there doing, uh, you know, helping us understand how how astronomy is finding exoplanets and where we hope to find life out there. And uh, uh, it, those were the serious talks. And uh, they were recorded and the whole thing. And the, that the audience, about 150 people, really, really ate it up. Yeah. And they were very serious about it. it was, there was nobody in there uh, sporting little alien uh, um, bubble antennas or anything like that. You saw all that stuff in the street fair. There was tons of people dressed like Star Wars alien characters and uh, grays and everything else downtown. And you would expect that with a street festival. But at the, at the serious after-hours talk... It was it was uh, a resort casual and shirt and tie kind of uh, kind of a conference. The good mix. Cheryl Costa is my guest here this evening on the Edge of the Unknown, researcher and author. We're talking UFOs. Let's go back to when you are a little bitty person. You're around 12 years old, you say, and you are seeing what you think is something in the sky that you've never seen before. Can you take us back to that day? Okay. Um, it was late August. It was about three weeks before we were going back to school, right after Labor Day, okay? And it was a Sunday afternoon. Uh, we had gone up to visit an aunt and uncle up in up in what I'm going to call a farming uh, community. Uh, the population of this place maybe 250 people at the, at the crossroads, and that's about it. And um, we had been at my uncle and aunt's house, and we were coming down off the hill. Uh, and we were heading west, and the sky, you have to understand, the sky was clear blue. That day, not a cloud in the sky, and it was uh, about four o'clock in the afternoon. We we're coming down the side of the hill. My mother has my father pull the car off the dirt road we're on, and she stops the car and she points at this silver ball parked out there like a rock. It is not moving. And to give your your audience and listeners an idea, hold your arm out at arm's length and look at your little fingernail. That's how big this thing was, okay, to us. And it just sat there. And we sat there for 15 minutes talking about it. And my mom said, well, you know, in, in 1965, NASA was still kind of new and all this kind of stuff. So she's telling me, well, it could be a weather balloon. It could be something the Air Force is doing. It could be something NASA's doing. You know, it could be people from another world. And that was the first time that kind of topic matter was talked about in my household. And my mom kind of explained that implication to me. And I was a 12-year-old. And, of course, my brother and sisters were toddlers, so they were kind of out of the out of the loop there. And then we got back on the road and started driving back down the hill. We were watching it. And when my father turned out to the state tar, you know, the, the, the blacktop road, uh, he was heading south. And I crawled up in the back window of that old Chevy Impala. And it was those, those Impalas had these huge windows, right? You know, and I crawled up in the back of it and I just sat there and watched that thing as we were driving down the highway. And it was just sitting there. But when it decided to go, about 15 minutes after my dad got on the state highway, 
it was like you see, you know, when you see this uh, in uh, Star Trek uh, type movies, you know, when the starship takes off, gone, you know, that type of thing. That's what happened. That thing would streaked out of there, probably a distance. If you hold your finger out, probably the distance of your little finger, and it was gone. Now, and, and that changes you. Trust I, me, that changes you. I, and, and honestly, when you're that age, you don't have really the, uh, maybe not, I don't want to say the word. I'm trying to think of the best way to say this. I mean, you really didn't just get on the phone and call and say, hey, did anybody else see this? Did, was there any other follow-up? Did anybody else report seeing the same sort of thing that you did at the same time? Not that, that, not that I know of. Mm-hmm. Um, we brought it up with my uncle, and he tried to write it off that was the, it was the, the evening star, you know, but sure, <laughs> not at 4 o'clock in the afternoon, you know. Right, exactly. And, and uh, so uh, that, was the, that was the context. If someone did report it, um, it, it was at this point in the game, it was six, almost 50 years ago, I – I would have to go back and go through some newspaper morgues to see if it happened. I don't even remember the exact date, you know, but I got a ballpark idea, but there was no follow up for that. But I'll give you a flavor. We had an awful lot of sightings in the southern tier of New York State in those days. OK, um, there was the uh, power blackout at that air at that uh, about a year before. OK, and UFOs had been. Uh, seen around various power stations and substations all over the state. Okay. And of course, everybody sort of laughs that off and they, they've attributed that whole Northeast power blackout to, you know, uh, a $3 part or someplace. But almost all the reports say that there was multiple sightings across the Northeast states, both in New York state and up into like New Hampshire and all this kind of stuff. So there was an awful lot of visibility for, Lots, lots of UFO sightings, and some of this stuff was coming from credible pilots, you know, guys that had just taken off at the airport, saw something bright hovering out by one of the power stations or something like this, you know. Uh, so I've re- I've gone back and read some of it since I, I write my newspaper column is mostly focused on New York State, and uh, so I've gone back and actually written article, uh, retro articles about it, and uh, uh, it's a fascinating, fascinating topic matter. Um, my second sighting, uh, first thing, let me qualify this. My mother and I became very close at that time. Remember, uh, you know, you're a 12, 13-year-old kid. You're just starting to get to that stage where mom and dad are stupid, you know? Well, of course, right. <laughs> and <laughs> and uh, my mom and I got developed a very strange bond. Uh, we both started getting books out of the library about UFOs, and there were new ones coming out all the time at that point. And uh, so if I got one, I'd read it and tell her about it. And if she got one, she'd read it and tell me about it. When Von Daniken's book came out, uh, the copy we had in our household was dog-eared to death, you know, and uh, we were just fascinated with it. Um, I went in the Air Force coming out of high school, 1970. Uh, I graduated in June of 70, and I was in the Air Force literally in boot camp in the middle of August. And uh, about a year after that, in 1970, well, it's 1971, uh, Christmas Eve, 1971, I was in Cameron Bay, Vietnam. I was an airman at the time. And uh, a friend of mine and I, uh, Tom and I, were walking down from our barracks. We were going to the midnight mass for something to do, Mm -hmm. okay? And Christmas midnight mass, we were walking across base, and where we were is about middle of the country. It's a Cameron Bay. It's a big peninsula that sticks out, and it's, you know, people think of Vietnam as jungles. Well, this peninsula was sand, okay? It's like going to Virginia Beach or something, you know? It's just nothing but sand. So um, we're walking down. It's like 1130 at night. And we see this thing going across this clear starlit sky, almost no light pollution. We see this thing streaking across the sky, and eh, it's probably a jet, you know. And, you know, it's Vietnam, you know, we figured it was a jet. And it stopped. And we sat there and looked at it, and Tom looked at me, and he said, well, it stopped. What's it going to do now? Jets don't do that. And in those days, they didn't. And then suddenly it starts dancing around like a fairy, and then, gone kind of like that like that other one i had talked about Mm -hmm. and uh, neither one of us had our minds on midnight mass when we got there i guarantee it interesting point even at that time and and we could say throughout the you know the first days of man looking up at the sky this phenomena is being reported everywhere and i think people sometimes forget that 
yeah, this happens in other countries, too. It's not just anything that's sitting here in the U.S. because they saw a movie about Area 51. Oh, yeah. Oh, of course. Uh, you know, all you have to do is watch a couple of ep the early seasons of uh, Ancient Aliens to see all that evidence. Uh, there's a lot of stuff out there. Uh, in fact, in my presentation, um, I have a first couple of five slides talk about the fact that, you know, frequently we hear that UFOs don't exist. I mean, I get mail all the time. Oh, there's no such thing. OK, I get email about it uh, again. Remember, I'm a journalist, so I'm a target, you know, so I get, uh, oh, it's all reported by nuts and kooks. Right. right. And oh, it, it, it the UFOs only been around since 1947. And that's when I pull the second slide up and I show them the, the Star Wars battle going on over um, Nuremberg, Germany on April 14th, 19, uh, 1561. You know, mm -hmm. and they, they said, well, wow, that, maybe that was a fluke. And I said, well, again, five years later. And I show them the next slide of Basel, Switzerland, five years later, having it happen on two separate weekends, you know, and, and I, I really hammer it home to people when I give a presentation, this stuff has been with us for a very, very long time. And the other thing I emphasize, if they wanted to invade us, they could have done it centuries ago with no resistance. And I, that is not why they're here. We don't know why they're here, but the, the best consensus I get from people is um, there's a guardian race. Uh, well, maybe even use that old idea of the Galactic Federation. You know, there's a guardian race up there watching this 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 planet and its populace develop into something that's worthy to be citizens of the galaxy, as they say. OK, and uh, that's kind of what. I have believed for quite a long time that that's what's going on. And, you know, you hear people saying, oh, well, you know, they're going to invade us, you know, and, you know, kind of like in Independence Day or Battle of L.A. or something like that. And I don't think that's the case. I really don't, um, because, like I said, they could have done it a long time ago and they haven't. And in fact, we think this, there's a lot of people who seem to think that maybe they had temp attempted to do that with the Black Plague. Hmm. You know, uh, because uh, it was kind of it seemed to be something people saw pe some form of people walking around in black cloaks, bl uh, uh, spraying a fog out and then everybody got sick. OK, so um, uh, maybe maybe or that they might have just thinned the herd at that point. You know, maybe that's what they felt was necessary. Who knows what what's going on? But somebody seems to be shepherding us, is my opinion. Cheryl okay. Costa, my guest here on the edge of the unknown. I heard a an interesting theory maybe two weeks ago. I can't remember where I saw it, and maybe in the break I can go and track it down. That there was a theory out there that we might be connected with another with an extraterrestrial race that we will eventually evolve into looking like with larger craniums, bigger eyes, the whole nine. So this whole concept of the gray. Um, the way that they look, that eventually we might evolve as a species into something like that. Have you ever heard anything like that? I know it's a little out there, and that's why I'm not so sure. No, I've that heard that. Um, so you have heard it. Okay. Yeah, I've heard it uh, on and off over the years, actually. There was that, there was this, there, the suggestion that, that they are our future selves, so to speak, our future uh, incarnations and if we see them here they they're been they're time traveling doing something with maybe uh, tweaking certain family genetic lines they seem to uh, the uh, abduction touch and experiencer things seems to be within families I, I during the course of doing my journalism I've talked to families that uh, it's been going on for generations with them so, uh, and also, you know, another thing about re regarding generations, you know, within families, you know, for a long time, um, people were scared into, oh, if you can't tell anybody you saw a UFO, everybody will think you're crazy, you know, <laughs> right. the men in black will come and get you, Woo you know, and, uh, so, you know, th there was a great line in a movie a few years ago, they saw this big big flying saucer come down and one guy looks at the other guy in the movie said, did you see that? And the other guy looks at him and says, no, and you didn't either. Right. You know, <laughs> and, and, and that was the mentality. What I found out in the class five years of writing my, my weekly column, I've bumped into some, el some elders 
you know, in a few cases, I've been invited to like a backyard barbecue. I'll go over there with a security person, make sure it's not a lynch mob or something. But uh, I'll get there and they'll throw a beer and a burger in my hand and say, hey, we want you to meet our Uncle Ralph who saw Foo Fighters in the war or Aunt Sally. And she saw this back on the farm with our deceased mother. And, you know, uh, this is what I get. Well, you sit down and start talking to them. And it's like talking to a combat veteran. All of a sudden, you see that look in their eyes. And sometimes they either start breaking out in tears or they start breaking into a sweat. And it, it, it is almost like a case of PTSD. You can see it. They're not they're not feeding you baloney. They're there again. Okay. Well, what I'm hearing from people is some of these stories are being passed down like family heirlooms within families. Interesting that you bring that up because now that I'm thinking about the way that we tell these tales, the way that we interact, the way that we communicate with things that we see, things that we're not sure that we're seeing. UFOs seem to have more of a feel of believability than a lot of the other things that are in popular culture and cryptozoology and that sort of thing. Yes. Is it, is it because it's just that we're now a little bit more opening our eyes to the technology that we're coming up with and possibly saying if there's another race out there, they've got to be more advanced than us and maybe do have the abilities that we are striving for right now? Well, I, I had a scientist come to me. I mean, this guy's a bona fide rocket scientist. Okay, he's responsible for an awful lot of satellites up there. His fingers were involved with Cassini. Okay, the Cassini probes. Okay, and both him and his wife. And at one point, he said, "Well, we can we can track uh, uh, something the size of a softball at you know two hundred miles out." These days, mm -hmm. I said, "Okay." He said, well, "Then how come we're not seeing the UFOs?" And I said, "Well, one." I says, uh, people like the FAA have tracked these things, mm -hmm. and then suddenly the tapes and everything disappear. Okay. The other thing is uh, we currently have stealth technology where we can take something like a big B-52 and from a radar signature uh, get it down to the birds and the bees from a radar signature standpoint. Okay. And if we've got that kind of technology – and, and thinking and way of doing things, um, somebody who's had the ability to either jump dimensions or come here from another planet or another galaxy, uh, they certainly must. Cheryl Costa, my guest here on The Edge of the Unknown. The Edge of the Unknown at gmail.com. Give us a yell, 716-218-3557. Talking UFOs tonight. Let's touch briefly before we have to take a break on this book that you put out in 2017. I mean, that's a lot of reports, 120,000 different reports of UFOs in the last, for the first 15 years of the 21st century. How long did this take and how did you come up with the idea to put this book of statistical data together? Okay, um, very briefly, uh, what we did was we had already done something like that for New York State. Since I write New York State, I have to have something to write about. And in the course of doing it, I we put county data to some of these sightings, and suddenly we're seeing patterns that nobody knew existed. Because if you look at either the MUFON or the New Fork databases, uh, it's in there by city and state, and that's about it. So we once we got this data cleaned up, and got it into a database. We added an extra field and we fed in county information to that city information. And while, you know, most people would look at uh, the data and say, well, you know, the bigger cities, it's, it's all driven by population. Well, okay, fine. They can say that. That's not necessarily the case. But what we did see, though, is a lot of little places that you never heard of. Some of these places up in rural areas are like a, are like a, uh, a, a cattle crossing with a general store that sells Hagen dazs and, <laughs> and, and a volunteer fire department. Okay. And, 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 and that's all they are. Well, suddenly a whole bunch of those places started showing up as a cluster because we had a County data and they, all these little bergs were in this County. And in some States we were able to correlate some of that with cattle mutilations. Okay. <laughs> So, but in New York state, we did this thing and suddenly the New York state investigators were saying, we didn't know there was a cluster there. We didn't know there was one there. And it, we didn't, we knew there was a Lake Ontario, uh, Lake uh, Erie effect, but we didn't know there was a Lake Ontario effect. You know, hmm. when we come back from break, you know, we can tell you more about that. Yeah. Let's dive into that and then we can expand that to the rest of the states. 
Researcher and author Cheryl Costa, my guest here on The Edge of the Unknown, taking you up until 10 o'clock. We'd love to hear from you. UFOs are on tap this evening as we explore the paranormal each and every Sunday night. My name is Mark. We're back right after this, everybody. Stick around. Don't nobody go nowhere. It's a fact. The best sounding music comes from analog audio found on vinyl records. But high quality vinyl has been hard to find until now. Records Etc. in Williamsville, New York is your destination for new and used vinyl records in a variety of categories from blues to Zydeco. Located in the Eastern Hills Mall, Records Etc. is easy to find and fun to shop. Classical, rock, comedy, and new wave are waiting for you at Records Etc. So dust off your turntable or pick one up at the store and start listening to music the way artists intended it to be heard. They also carry rock and roll memorabilia, t-shirts, posters, and more. That's Records Etc. in the Eastern Hills Mall in Williamsville. Call 716-481-7177 and ask for Ray for more information. Records Etc. Tunes for our times. Listen and imagine. It takes five seconds to send a text, and for those five seconds, you're driving blind. Life is worth more than a text. Stay alive. Don't text and drive. Visit StopTextStopRex.org, a message brought to you by the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, Project Yellow Light, Noise, and the Ad Council. Hello, what are your fears? Are you badgered by domestic affairs, haunted by ghosts or demons, terrorized by those who would use magic as a weapon, or tormented from within? I can end it. I can stop it. I can cast them away, for I am a sorcerer, and protecting people from these things is what I do. Seek my services at SorcererForHire.com or call now for faster service, 206-501-0444, because time is not on your side. The moment my son saw a redwood tree. It's huge! Is the moment I knew that for him. You can't even see the top of that thing! Even the sky has no limit. There are some moments only the forest can inspire. Find yours at discovertheforest.org. Learn about forests near you and discover cool things to do when you go. Your moment is out there. Find it at discovertheforest.org. Brought to you by the U.S. Forest Service and the Ad Council. Looking for the best Japanese and Thai cuisine in western New York? Then you have to visit Teton Kitchen at 415 Dick Road in Depew. From appetizers and soups, simple, special, big and fusion style maki, to sushi, sashimi and tempura, you won't get a range of items like this anywhere. Hungry for more? Teton Kitchen offers a full dinner menu and kushiyaki dishes, as well as a huge variety of sake, wine, beer, both domestic and Asian imports. Owner Taka and his bride, Kin, are proud to boast that Teton Kitchen is Yelp's number one rated restaurant in Western New York, and they welcome you for lunch or dinner seven days a week with takeout and online ordering available. Visit tetonkitchen.com for their full menu, hours, and online ordering, or call 716-393-3720. Teton Kitchen, 415 Dick Road in Depew. Hey, this is Dr. Sandy Peters, and you're listening to The Edge of the Unknown. And 
Welcome back to the Edge of the Unknown. Thank you very much, Dr. Sandy Peters, for bringing us back. What a great guest she was. And, man, we've got a great guest this evening with Cheryl Costa as we are talking about UFOs. And, man, just the numbers alone in this book that Cheryl has compiled, the reports in just the first 15 years of this 21st century, 121,000 sightings. That's reported sightings, folks. That's not things that people didn't report. We're just delving into these numbers in that book. This is a very different book. This is for the folks who really like to cross-reference, I would assume, and, and see the numbers and and go from region to region and say, hey, they're seeing different things in different places and maybe pulling off and compiling other data from the data that's in here. Cheryl, thanks again for being with us. I appreciate it. And let's get back into this book. You're, you're saying that this is kind of branching out from something that you did in New York State. What was it like? Right. And it must have been a daunting task to say, okay, New York State's one area. The entire U.S.? Wow. Yeah, yeah. Okay, well, here's what happened. Uh, we had all these different New York State investigators looking at pieces of the New York data that we had done because I wrote it for my own column to use, give to fuel stories, you know, and uh, suddenly they're saying we didn't know about that, we didn't know about that either, you know, that kind of thing. So one October evening, uh, Linda and I were sitting uh, sitting in our favorite pub, staring at each other over a pint, and uh, waiting for our burgers, as they say, and we were saying, look at all the cool stuff we found. And, and then, of course, the conversation said, what if we did the whole country? And we just sat there and stared at each other for about five minutes. And I said, it would probably take a year. And she says, if not more. You know, and then uh, she started saying, uh, and Linda's got the science degrees of the two of us, okay? She's a, a research librarian. Uh, she used to work at the uh, National Academy of Science. She was the head librarian at the Environmental Protection Agency's Toxicology Library uh, for 15 years. So she's the scientist of the two of us. Me, I got an arts and entertainment degree, but I did do the crunching on the numbers. And uh, and I have the analysis background from when I did inf uh, data security for Lockheed Martin. Uh, I, I really knew how to crunch data, and I knew how to look for patterns. Okay, and that's what my skills were. Uh, and then after I was retired from Lockheed Martin, uh, I went to work for a major corporate bank for two years. And they taught me some analysis of, of spreadsheet analysis that I had never seen, not in Lockheed. It was a different type of analysis. And uh, after, after that, th that was how these charts came to be. And we said, well, Sounds now I know how to do, do these particular kinds of analysis. Let's consider doing the whole country. So we agree. We we had both had been contractors. This is important to understand. Mm -hmm. She was a contract librarian to federal libraries. I was a contractor with Lockheed Martin. I worked down in the D.C. area like she did. We're Beltway Bandits, and uh, the uh, that's the term they use for contractors down there. <laughs> and uh, so. Um, one of the things we had done when we did New York State, New York State took us four or five months to do because we didn't know what we were doing. Okay. So we wrote down as we figured out a faster way of doing certain things like putting the county data in or cleaning up the, 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 the very unusual things with each database, MUFON or Newfort had quirks that were dirty. Okay. In terms of data. Okay, and anybody's ever done cleanup on on data will appreciate what I'm talking about. So um, we wrote down how to do it. We sat there and wrote process for ourselves while we were doing New York State. So when we went to go do the national stuff, uh, we already had a, a method. This is how you clean up a database on the first pass. This is how you clean it up on the second pass. And, and then we hit it in tiers, you know. And that's what we did. So we planned to download the data, and the decision was made, and you're going to love this, to do only 2001 through 2015, okay? The idea being too many UFO books were out there that were all, that only dealt with crash here or crash there, and it seemed like an FM, like a ra an advertisement for an FM radio station, the best UFO crashes from the 50s, <laughs> 60s, and 70s, you know? Right. And that's what all seemed to be out there. 
plus the data that was in either one of the national databases much before 1999 was in very, very low numbers. We're talking 50, 60, maybe 20 a year. Okay, it wasn't till people started getting on broadband in the late 90s that we start seeing an uptick in the ability of people to report. Mm. This is what we call an artifact of reporting. So we said, Linda looked at me and says, let's do the first 21st century book of UFO research. Okay. And she says, we're going to make it a reference book, kind of like a UFO census. And there's not going to be any cute aliens on the cover. It's going to be as boring as a government report. And that was the subversive angle on the whole thing. We wanted that thing to look comfortable on a congressman's ta desk. Okay. Mm hmm and, you know, there's always that implied, oomph, well, it must be official. It looks like a regular official report, you know. So, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> <laughs> and that was kind of the mentality behind it. So on, we decided to do our download, uh, at least for MUFON, which, or not New, MUFON, uh, New Fork, National UFO Reporting Center. We decided to do it on New Year's morning, okay, because we figured p uh, bandwidth would be good. And it was. People are sleeping it off. That's so we correct. got up about 530 in the morning and started, and down, started downloading the online public database. We had it all down in about three hours, all, all 50 states in the district in about three hours. And we, we sucked it down using spreadsheets. And uh, it was uh, very straightforward. So we started doing the cleanup process. And then by May, uh, we had the New Fork data pretty well cleaned up. And we had added county data. And then what we did was we reached out to MUFON. Well, there was a little bit of a bureaucracy, and the left hand didn't know what the right hand was doing. And uh, the guy we finally ended up with was asking us 20 questions on what we were really doing and what we were going to use the data for. And <laughs> send us a project plan of what you're doing. And we weren't going to give away our book. Sure. You course. know? And so um, Linda, being the executive type, she got on the telephone with him. And 20 minutes later, I had a file. I'd go in nine rounds with these guys for five <laughs> weeks. She gets on the phone. They, they they talk, manager talk, and the next thing you know, I've got the file 20 minutes later. Did they know? think that you were just going to steal research or, or use it against them, or what was their concern? And you don't have I, to get into that if you don't No, want to I do don't that. know. I don't know what the concern was. Sure. Um I might have been nosy. They might just wanted to know what kind of, if we were just some some idiots wanting to work with their data and we're going to embarrass them with it or something like that. Sure, sure. Um, we give them a very high level what we were doing. Okay. Now, show you how much things have changed. I was doing the international databases a couple of weeks uh, about a month ago, and uh, I simply made a call into Jan Hardison and said, "Hey, Jan, I'm getting ready to do what I did for the United States. I'm getting ready to do the international. Can I have the database?" I had like three, four days later, right. you know, it was not a big deal. Um, but we've broken, we've broken down those barriers and we know who to call now and all that sort of thing. So, but, so we got the data cleaned up and started adding county data to it. And a couple of things we found out 7% overall of the database of that 120,000 we were talking about mm -hmm. 7%. That was about 3000, maybe 3,500. People didn't fill in the name of their city. Everything about the UFO sighting, date, time, all this stuff, it's all there, but they wouldn't fill in the name of their town hmm. or city. Or they if they would say something else like, uh, my mother asked me not to tell you, or my husband asked me not to tell you, or the sheriff asked us not to tell you, you know, something like that, or I'm scared to tell you. Okay? And it, that was a bit unnerving. So we had to put in uh, unspecified in those columns, mm -hmm. in, in that field. And then when we actually went to do a, a county breakdown within every state, we had to establish the proverbial unknown county because wow. every state reflected some of this, okay? Mm -hmm. And uh, that was that was a, a tough part right there. And, um, you know, the first thing, you know, and some people – when the book first came out, thought all we did was copy the databases and print all the put all the information, you know, the, the, all, the whole report. And actually, the report information, all we wanted to know was what, when, and where. Okay, and what shape. That's all we had. So the first, almost the first thing we got rid of was that field that had all the verbiage about the sighting. Mm -hmm. 
We didn't care. We were simply analyzing at a high level. Now, a lot of people say, well, why didn't you vet, vet every single one of them? And, and, and our answer was, wait a minute, we don't have a time machine and go back there and vet <laughs> everything that was done back in 2001. And this isn't about vetting every single one. This was about looking at the larger big data picture. And we're, this is 21st century where we work with big data. So we already knew there was some percentage of junk in there. Okay, but let's look at the bigger phenomena here. And, 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 and Linda was c coming at it from the context of epidemiology. And when this is like, okay, we know certain kind, and this is how she explains it. We know certain chemicals will cause these kinds of symptoms and this kind of illness with people or children. Okay. So if we go and we find clusters of these kinds of children, maybe we should go to that area and start looking for um, contamination of a particular type of chemical. And that's how they found Love Canal and some other places like that. Right. So we applied the same idea to the to the UFO reports, we weren't really care, carried about. They were all in big cities. Now that didn't bother us. What we were looking for is where were these other less populous clusters and why were they there? I'll give you an example in New York State. This is one uh, one of my favorite ones. This is just a New York State number. I went to the top of uh, the St. Lawrence Seaway, which is St. Lawrence County. Followed it down. Took all the counties that came down across from St. Lawrence County up, up on the seaway, uh, all the way down across Lake Ontario, down past Buffalo and the Erie area, and it sort of ends in the middle of Lake Erie, okay, the, 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 the actual area of the St. Lawrence Seaway, okay? Sure. And we added up all the numbers for all those counties, and it represented 19% of the sightings for New York State. Mm -hmm. We said, now, wait a minute, this is interesting. So we said, will this hold up someplace else? So we went up to Lake Champlain, came right down the Hudson to the Atlantic Ocean, didn't care about Long Island since uh, Hudson just kind of passes by it, and we added that up. It was 32% of New York State sightings. Th those two waterways alone were 51% of New York State sightings. Hmm. Interesting. And Another thing we found out when we did the national stuff, we used, uh, in order to, again, make it look like a government report, we used census maps for as we broke up the, 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 the areas of the country into zones. Okay, we used real census maps. And um, their site had all kinds of great availability for graphics, so we just downloaded it and put our data on it. And uh, I was on a radio show one night after the book came out, and I'm sitting there, and I've got the book in my lap. And during a commercial break, I happened to notice, and I didn't notice this when we were putting the book together. If you followed all of the states that were touching the Great Lakes, their numbers were in the thousands. We're talking three, four, five thousand 5,000 sightings a year mm -hmm. or over that 15-year period. Sure. Okay? Move two states away, and the numbers were in the low hundreds. So, I mean, there's a direct correlation with water, travel, and, and sightings. There, there's a relationship. I don't want to say a correlation. We have sure. a little poster up in the room where we worked on this thing that said correlation does not necessarily equal causality. Exactly. That's true. I shouldn't have said that. Okay. So we, we didn't. I mean, another one everybody jumps on. Uh, California was number one when we came out with the numbers, you know. Okay. And in fact, that was the first press we got on this thing 15,836 sightings, right? In that 15 year period. Well, everybody on the West Coast was going, California's number one, rah, 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 you know. And of course, <laughs> everybody knee jerk, like on Facebook, everybody near jerk, well, they got a population that's bigger than any other state. Yep. Well, yeah, that's an easy knee jerk. What we found out later is that isn't necessarily the driver. Give you an example. Florida is number two. Texas is number three. Okay, Florida had 7,787. Texas had 7,058. Okay. Texas has half the uh, Texas has twice the population of Florida. Right. So how do you? I mean, where, what do you really run with with the numbers when it comes down to that? Where, you know, and I'm sure there's certain counties that might be smaller than others and have higher numbers. I mean, that's where it starts to get mind boggling for me. When you get into the stats of it, I, I just I'll say I'm already getting a headache right now, Cheryl. Right. Well, that's the thing we tell everybody: <laughs> take a breath. Don't <laughs> don't just say population's the driver. There's right. something else going on. Okay. And uh, so I'll 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 reveal the spoiler now. Okay. Okay. We discovered, and then I'll tell you how we found it. 
uh, we found that population, temperate weather, and leisure time were the major drivers. There's a couple other minor factors we've discovered as well, but uh, population, temperate weather, and leisure time. Let me explain. When I did a chart with the New York State one, in fact, the New York State investigators thought it was a stupid chart. It was a little bar chart that put UFOs against month of the year, January through December, okay? And in New York State, it was all had this quiescent level, we'll say about, you know, about 50 a year or something like that, uh, 50 a year or 50, 50, 60, 100, something like that. And then when it, it start, got to like May, it started to tick up a little bit, started to tick up a little bit more in June. July and August start through the roof. Mm-hmm. And then September, it's ticking down like it was in June. And then uh, October, November, December are like January, February, March, April, this quiescent level. OK, and we thought when, of course, when I published that chart on my column, everybody was emailing me like I was an idiot. Well, Shara, duh, it's the summertime. This one, everybody sees UFOs. You're laying on the hood of your car. You see UFOs. Oh, yeah, yeah, duh, you know, right. and that's what everybody said. And I made that assumption like everybody else. The next thing I know, Linda's putting this stuff together. I crunched all the numbers. She's making the tables from the crunched numbers. She, I've already given her all these graphic charts we, that we generated through uh, Excel. And uh, all of a sudden, she looks over her computer terminal at me one day. I'm sitting there writing the analysis chapters. And she said, hey, did you notice that there's a latitude issue, difference with the month charts? I said, what do you mean? She said, well, it's different, different latitudes. And I said, what? So we get in there. The northern states had that that july august thing through the roof Mm -hmm. i mean really through the roof and the you get down the mid-atlantic states maryland virginia and go straight across the country and that that peak in the middle with those july and august starts coming down it starts flattening out starts flattening out Hmm. you get to the deep south states and it's statistically flat it's like a picket fence and we said, whoa, what is going on here? Except Florida, it's, it's got the picket fence look, but January and, Feb- uh, January and December are, peaked, are spiked up. It's, we attribute that to snowbirds, mm-hmm. people going down south for the winter, that type sure. of thing. And uh, so we started looking at this, and it, it was that was the driver for temperate weather. Okay. Right. We started seeing that that was a driving factor. And it was so funny because the guy who did the story about us in the New York Times, that was an unusual fluke. Um, the New York Times hadn't said a nice thing about UFOs in 70 years. Right. And this is this is an <laughs> April time frame. In March, April, March is when the book came out. Uh, this is like many months before December 16th in 2017 when they came out and talked about the Pentagon. Okay. Mm-hmm. And this Pulitzer Prize winning uh, uh, author, uh, reporter, uh, went to the editors with this two and a half pound, eight and a half by 11 book, 374 pages, threw it on somebody's desk and said some uh, little old ladies up in Syracuse, New York, did the science. And it caught their attention, especially since it looked at the whole country and went right down to the county level. And they did this really super, the first positive story about UFOs. They put it in Science Magazine in the New York Times, for goodness sake. Mm. And, and, of course, our popularity went through the road. I'd been retired about two months, and I thought it was going to be coasting. Suddenly, the book takes on a life of its own, and I'm working eight, 12 hours a day keeping <laughs> up with the media. You know, right. it was crazy, you know, and so much for being retired, you know. And um, but so. This was the important thing. And in fact, that reporter came up. You'll love this one. Your audience is going to love this one. Sure. Uh, The reporter went upstairs. We had turned the master bedroom in that 100-year-old house into an upstairs parlor. It was the warmest room in the house. So at one end, we had our sewing area. We had our sewing tables and sergers and, uh, uh, you know, two or three different sewing types of sewing machines and cutting tables and all that stuff. And her terminal was sitting right there. And mine was on the other side. And there was our, like a little living room nook over there in the corner, okay? And uh, he, he commented that it was in our uh, – we did all these calculations and all this layout in our sewing room. The next day on Vogue – Dot com for like Vogue magazine. Vogue.com does the first ever UFO story they ever published. Mm. 
and it was about our book and they had some pretty model looking off into the sky, you know, and it was, it was a really weird coup to say, Hey, we've got the first UFO article ever in a Vogue in Vogue magazine, you know, but, um, <laughs> but do you think the, that because the, the, the approach that you took was really what was more intriguing rather than it be a, a collection of stories of, I was abducted and, and I saw this whatsoever. I mean, this was really more just numbers and science based. And that's probably what intrigued everybody, obviously. Yeah. Well, that was a big argument. Even the New York Times said that because up until then, all, it was always personal accounts and everything. And uh, nobody really knew. And one of the points that was made to me by one of the editors was you, you girls have written this seminal book on UFO statistics. Nobody had ever done it before. In fact, in one radio interview, somebody asked me, had anybody done this? I said, well, not in a, cla not in a non-classified environment they hadn't. Linda went out. Linda's a librarian. She went out into the, the worldwide uh, database for books. And the only thing that even came close to a statistical study about UFO sightings was a portion of the, of the Blue Book portion of the Condon Report in 1968. And we all know what that did for UFOlogy. Cheryl, okay, I'm sorry. Cheryl Costa is my guest here on the edge of the unknown. We're talking right now about her book, UFO Sightings Desk Reference. If you don't have it in your local bookstore, you can find it online. Go to Amazon. I'm sure that they've got it there. Uh, what was the overall reception of it in the UFO community? We're talking Vogue. We're talking New York Times. Let's talk a little bit about colleagues and people who, outside of a passing interest, would want this on their desk as a reference tool. Um. It was funny because we had two things. People would he heard that it was it was information taken from both databases. Okay, so there was this knee jerk reaction. That all we did was copy the databases, and all we've done is put those online databases into print. Okay, all you did was print a whole bunch of sightings, and that's not what we did. Mm -hmm. The name of the book is UFO Sightings Desk Reference, United States of America, two thousand one to two thousand fifteen. And uh, we, even the New York Times article straight up said, look, there's no, there's no stories, no anecdotal commentary. There's a couple of chapters of analysis and charts and graphs and tables. And this thing's got all, and I warn people right now, if you're going to buy the book, it's on Amazon and, and we publish through Amazon. They're our publisher. And uh, I warn you now, it's got all the charm of a bank ledger. <laughs> OK, but if you're any kind of a researcher, oh, I'll give you an example. I've had a lot of MUFON investigators say to me, this thing is great because if they had to go into a particular county in their state, they can flip this thing over and they got a 15 year study of both databases, not just CMS at MUFON. Mm -hmm. OK, and we found that the ratio between New Fork and MUFON was a, a 60, 40, 70, 30 kind of thing. New Fork was the predominant database most of the time. In fact, even in two states, it was like 80-20 type of thing, okay? 80%, okay. 70%, uh, 60%, New Fork, and you know, the, the smaller numbers being MUFON. Now, there were three states where MUFON was the dominant state, okay? And we actually make a little star next to that on our, in, in the front part of the book. We say, these states are dominant MUFON. So some about a year or two ago, some guy came out, uh, pulled the New Fork data, and set, told everybody that Washington State was the uh, Washington State and the Chicago area, Cook County area, was the hot spots for UFOs. Unfortunately, that's the, that he was working with one side of the data, and it skewed because there was more. You didn't have the MUFON data to balance it out and give a complete picture. Okay. Sure. And what we've given people is a good. 15 year snapshot in the 21st century. Now you were talking about the thing, whether or not like one in, t you know, in some conventions, they'll tell you one in 10 people reports what they see. And there's, just, there's some good evidence that where guys like Stanton Friedman would go and talk to a thousand or 2000 students. They say, how many people saw a UFO? Almost every hand goes up. And then they say, how many people reported it? And they'd say, have somebody out there counting it. And they always come up with a number of about 10%. Okay. Um, a lot of the experts and investigators and I that have talked at some of these symposiums and things, you know, over a cup of coffee or dinner or something like that, we have this sense that the number might be more like one in 40. Hmm. 
So, you know, wow. uh, it, it, it's, it's a hard call. It's hard to know. But I've done that measurement myself when I do a talk at like a library or something like that. I'll have 100 people sitting out there. Uh, and I'll uh, and I'll say how many people and half most of the hands go up and then say how many have reported it. And it's just a handful. So that might be a real good number. Uh, this 140. We don't know. Um, it, again, it's the ability of people to report. I'll give you one more cool example. Back the week of uh, Martin Luther King Day, the week prior to Martin Luther King Day weekend back in February this year. Local cable system, uh, well, the cable system here in New York State used to be Time Warner. It was bought out by Spectrum. Yep. Okay. And the people who do the news for Spectrum is uh, Charter Communications. Okay. And I had approached them and about doing a story. Because I had all this great data and I was a local researcher with national credentials. And they said, okay, fine. So uh, this gal came up and interviewed me in an apartment and then they came that evening to the talk I was doing at this one very popular library on the other side of town. So we went over there. They had two crews over there, part one to shoot me and one to uh, talk to people. Okay. And they ran it that evening on the 11 o'clock news. Okay. And I thought moose cycle wise, maybe they've run it that evening and maybe the next day. Okay. It was going into the weekend. They ran it. They had such a response on their website to it. You know how they post the video up for their news and all that. Absolutely. Uh, they, um, they ran it every hour on the 55 in the hour for the entire four day weekend. I got over a hundred phone calls at my home and they weren't kooks, crackpots and, and people yelling at me. I don't believe in UFOs. No, almost every single one of them was I know you work with the UFO numbers. I know you do the research. I know you'll understand. I had this sighting 5, 10, 15, 20, 60 years ago in one case. For the week, that weekend, for about 100 people, I was UFO mother confessor. All they wanted to do was get that sighting off their chest. And don't you think that it goes back to your personality, who you are, versus the old way that you were talking about? Did you see that? No, neither did you. Now people see folks like yourself who are interested in this that aren't going to shun them, that are going to listen. And number one, you're not going to file them away. Number two, you are going to give them that voice to where they can say something in a safe place instead of fearing that ridicule or being brushed I, off completely. I agree. I agree very much. In fact, I was surprised with the amount of people that came on camera with the news crew and talked about it. It was a very, I mean, I'm going to say this way, it was a very gray audience. A lot of salt and pepper hair and gray hair out there in that audience. And uh, and they, they were willing to talk about it and uh, you know, say, hey, I saw this thing in 65. I saw this thing in 74. You know, it, that, and, they, and they had all this footage, Charter did. So uh, that has led to another conversation, and they had more web page hits on that than they've ever had on any single story. Hmm. Uh, I mean, we're talking, uh, they say an average story polls 1500, maybe 2000, maybe if it's really popular, it's about something SU sports did maybe three, 4,000, they pulled 12, 15,000 on this story. Okay. And it, 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 social media, people start sharing it with friends and it, it made the trick. Well, what, what we're, talking about now this is i should probably shouldn't talk about this but we've talked about the idea they didn't have a long form format in their news format mm -hmm. everything was short one and a half two minute stories uh and they didn't really have a long form format but they decided to develop a long form format and after this interview and we're t they're going to have a news magazine they're talking about it it's not a done deal yet but they're talking about it and if they do, there's a very good chance uh, I'm going to have a segment on there talk, talking about New York State UFO stories and maybe stories from the rest of the country. Oh, great! And that would be cool. And yeah, it'd be New exciting. York State. It would be New York statewide if it, they do it. Hey, you know we do have to take a break, but I also want to talk about your show. We've also got some folks who have written in, and I uh -huh. want to remind everybody: Hey, you can call in too. Seven one six. 218-3557, the edge of the unknown at gmail.com. We've got a question in live chat that uh, we're going to get to, but you know what, guys? We're going to take a break first. 
Cheryl Costa is my guest here on the edge of the unknown. Right here from New York State, we're talking about her book, UFO Sightings, Desk Reference, United States of America, 2001 to 2015, and UFOs in general. We would love to hear from you. We're going to be back right after the short break. we got to pay some bills and much more of the edge of the unknown coming up. My name is Mark. Thanks for hanging out with me late on a Sunday night. We're back right after this. <laughs> Siggy's Good Food in Manhattan sets the standard for home-style comfort food in a warm and casual environment. Located at 292 Elizabeth Street between Houston and Bleecker, Siggy's Good Food offers something for everyone. Vegetarian and meat eaters alike will find dozens of dishes to wet their palates and satisfy their appetites at great prices. Siggy's menu has many gluten-free and lactose-free dishes, too, and everything is made with 100% organic, sustainable, and whole food ingredients. See the full menu at siggysgoodfood.com or call 212-226-5775. Make it your business to check out Siggy's Good Food, open Monday through Sunday, 11 a.m. to 10.30 p.m., with brunch on the weekends from 11 until 3.30. Takeout and delivery are also available. That's Siggy's Good Food in Manhattan, siggysgoodfood.com, 212-226-5775. And remember, if you're an extraterrestrial, aliens eat free. If you live in the western New York or southern Ontario area and are looking to get a tattoo, then go see the cats at Sixth Order Tattoo in Buffalo, New York. Voted Best Tattoo Shop by Buffalo Spree Magazine, these are the guys to see for any ink project you can dream of. Shop owner Chris Capola and artist Joe Fomar, Andy Viscalia, Nick Conter, Jake Miracle, and John Rutsky are proficient in many tattoo styles, including traditional American, Japanese, modern Polynesian, as well as illustrated and portrait tattoos. Have a design in mind? Bring it in. Stuck on ideas? They've got plenty to show you. I recently had my eighth piece of art inked by my man Joe Fomar, and I'm telling you, there's no other guy I trust with an ink gun, and that's why you should make an appointment at Sixth Order Tattoo today. Call them, 716-633-7171, or stop in. They're located at 3503 Genesee Street, just east of Union Road. Check out their website, SixthOrderTattoo.com, and find them on Facebook. Sixth Order Tattoo. The best thing for your body. We all face multiple stressors each day, from work deadlines and home and family obligations, not to mention body aches and pains that come with both active and inactive lifestyles. A great way to ease those tensions is by floating at the Silver Essence Floating Spa in Williamsville, New York. What is floating? It's a highly effective and therapeutic relaxation experience in which your body is suspended in warm, comforting salt water without stimulation from lights or sounds. Lay back and let tension drift away as you float in nearly zero gravity while your body is replenished with essential minerals like magnesium, potassium, sodium, and calcium, minerals vital to our health that are lost throughout the day. Floating at the Silver Essence Floating Spa is great for anyone, athletes, those rehabilitating from injury, or if you're just looking for a new way to relax. Floating is even known to increase creativity and speed up the healing process. Silver Essence is open Monday through Saturday with convenient morning and evening hours, and they offer infrared sauna treatments, membership deals, special packages, and much more. Check them out online at SilverEssenceFloatingSpa.com or call 716-568-7985. Conveniently located in downtown Williamsville. They're just minutes from anywhere. That's the Silver Essence Floating Spa. Get your float on and tell them you heard about them on the Edge of the Unknown. For those interested in delving deep into the paranormal, why not look into the Paratech Store? Located at paratechstore.com, browsers will find the latest in investigative equipment, books, and more. Items go beyond technical equipment. Mojo bags, stone sets, and other curiosities await your exploration at the Paratech Store. ParatechStore.com. Visit them today. Are you ready for something really scary? 
stop over to the campfire at Uncle Josh's True Scary Stories on YouTube. Here's some of the most terrifying stories you've ever heard. Ghosts, monsters in the woods, stalkers, unexplained phenomenon, and more. And the best part? All of the stories are true. Got a story you'd like to share? Send it to Uncle Josh, True Scary Stories at gmail.com. Uncle Josh's True Scary Stories on YouTube, where fact is more terrifying than fiction. This is Dr. Bruce McAbee, and you're listening to The Edge of the Unknown with Mark Henry. And into hour number two we go here on The Edge of the Unknown. Thanks for hanging out with me late on a Sunday evening. If you're on the East Coast, anywhere else, hey, good morning, good afternoon. Thanks for being here and doing a little paranormal talk. You know, I just mentioned to my guest Cheryl Costa about being someone who is receptive and is not going to laugh or or make fun or whatever when someone has a report of something that they think they've seen, whether it's UFOs, Bigfoot, whatever the kinds of things that we talk about. Uh, Kind of the reason that I've been doing this show since 2010. It's that way that we can get together and talk about stuff that we might not be able to on a daily basis. We obviously don't run into one each, one another all the time, but on Sunday evenings we can get together and explore some pretty interesting topics. We have not done UFOs in a long, long time, and I am having a blast talking about it tonight. I hope you are as well. We would love to hear from you. 716-218-3557 is the phone number. And, of course, the email bag is always open for you, theedgeoftheunknown at Gmail. Dot com. Cheryl, before we get back into our conversation, I want to grab a question from our live chat room. And I don't know if this is something you can speak to, but this comes from Dave. And he's asking if there is a correlation between UFO sightings and areas where there have been nuclear testings. I don't know if you've gotten that deep into your research, but perhaps you have. Well, OK, it, re, nuclear testing happens. At, those areas usually don't have any population to report such things. There you go, Dave. Perfect. <laughs> that was an easy one. <laughs> okay. Now the, let's go, let's put an added spin on it. In fact, I got asked this uh, uh, Saturday uh, uh, Saturday night. Sure. Um, a couple of people uh, asked me, "Well, uh, is there any correlation to like nuclear power plants?" Okay. There's 55 of them, and I was able to look up the there was you know some activist sites out there about nuclear safety that are type, type of thing and i was able to literally look up a spreadsheet of uh, all of the plants and their uh, their addresses which i was able to um, look up the addresses 55 wasn't a big deal look up their addresses against and put it against the county and uh, uh, my database so you know and this is important to know um, I have the ability, if you give me a state and a county, I have the ability to drill down to all the municipalities in that county that had reported sightings. We didn't publish it because it would have made the book about uh, about 900 pages and it would have cost over $100 to publish it, to, to sell it. Sure. Um, but we, I have that ability to do this. So I looked up every single nuclear power plant in the country and no, they don't seem to be loitering around our nuclear plants, uh, with the one exception. Uh, the Indian plant site out, out on the Hudson, um, yeah, they ha- used to have a lot of sightings around that. And it's a, they're getting ready to close it because it's a little bit of a dirty reactor. But for the most part, no, they're not hanging around that. And as far as military sites, most of the bases in the United States anymore are reserve bases. Only like your major seaports and uh, that type of thing are really have the active service going on. I interviewed Lou Alessandro. He was the guy who was uh, controlling all this stuff back in the Pentagon. And uh, the, and when they re- re- revealed that there was this five-year, $20 million contract going on, he was the guy that was in charge of it there. And we talked about it, and it really seems that majority of the loitering that the UFOs do around our military happens to be at bases or associated with active fleets who have very advanced technology. 
Okay, mm -hmm. so if the fleet happens to be over uh, visiting the Mediterranean, they have a lot of reports of UFOs in the Mediterranean. You know, if they happen to be someplace else, wherever they happen to be, that's where the UFO sightings are. That's where you have these encounters like they had with the Nimitz. Uh, this stuff happens much more than people realize. Uh, it just doesn't bubble up to the, the, the general public as a rule. What about regular power plants? I know up here, not too far away on the shores of Lake Ontario, we have the Somerset Power Plant. There are lots of sightings, especially, as you mentioned, in temperate weather over Lake Ontario. Is there a distinction that we should make between a regular electric power plant, which maybe it's hydroelectric, versus nuclear? Um, well, actually, the guy that really asked that question to is Tom Conwell. You want to have him as a guest, I'll get you his information. Sure. Okay. Tom did his study parallel to me. He's here in New York state and Tom, uh, took fireballs as, a, as the, as his, uh, what he tracked. Okay. And he tracked where they were. And, uh, he also started looking at what was in those areas. He looked at everything from native American lower. He looked at pollution tables, all of this sort of stuff. Okay. And he found out that they tend to hang around a lot of old mining sites. They hang around pollution sites. Uh, they're interested in a lot of that stuff. And he is the guy who could probably tell you all of that information. I really didn't chase down uh, whether they were hanging around normal, normal power plants. I only did nuclear because it kept coming up in presentations. People would ask during question and answer, do they hang around our nuclear power plants? You know, like normal power plants, you know, the, uh, for electricity. And no, they don't. Now, where are you at, Mark? I'm right outside of Buffalo, New York. Okay, what county? I am in Erie. Okay, you're in Erie. Okay. Um, uh, the uh, There's only four plants, nuclear plants, in New York State. There's right. the Indian Point, uh, and there's, there's one up here in Fulton in Oswego County, and then there's one over in Yates County down near Monroe, which is essentially the Rochester area. Mm -hmm. But amazingly enough, the sightings in Yates County there are – um, dirt bucket. They're they're really small, okay. Um, but the the nuclear plants there, okay. But the majority of sightings for Lake Ontario are showing up at Monroe County, which is essentially the Rochester area region, okay. But not Rochester per se. Right. So. Again, nuclear power plants, there doesn't seem to be a huge amount of interest in them in the military basis. Again, not a huge amount of interest in them. Um, and, and that's what throws a lot of people. In fact, a lot of people, when the book was first coming out, everybody was trying to tell me where they are. And in most cases, that's where they're not. It, the logic, what everybody told me where they thought they were, oh, they're all out in the desert. <laughs> that holds true maybe for Phoenix and for the Maricopa County area in Arizona. But for the most part, no, they don't. Um, do they uh, do they hang out in Alaska? No, they don't. Are they over Washington, D.C.? Washington, D.C. ranked number 51 of 51. I would think, and I mean, just again, not jumping to conclusions, but I would think there are certain areas that I would say I would expect there to be low, D.C. being one of them, with the fact, with the sophisticated radar that they have to have because it is, you know, the hub of our, our political set, that why would something that knew that it could possibly be intercepted hang around that area as much as possible? I would think that it would go someplace where it wouldn't. Well, okay, uh, but remember the other factor, leisure community, uh, leisure time, okay? If you want to see the sightings for Washington, D.C. area, you go out to the Maryland, Virginia, and Delaware suburbs. That's where they are. Mm -hmm. That's where the sightings are because right. people do it in their leisure time. Besides that, the light pollution in Washington D.C. you can't see beans. You can't see anything. You got anyway. <laughs> you got right. you got jet you got jet traffic flying out of National Airport virtually all of, from about six o'clock in the morning to about ten eleven o'clock at night. Every about every two minutes, something's taking off or landing. Um, the airspace is very crowded there. OK, but uh, the light pollution is even worse because uh, I lived there for 26 years. Linda lived there 30 and the light pollution is terrible. You have a hard enough time seeing the moon's about the only thing you can see in downtown D.C. at night, even on a clear night. You might see Sirius or some real serious bright star. But beyond that, the light pollution is terrible because all the all the monuments are all lit up and everything. 
Cheryl Costa, my guest here on the edge of the unknown. I'm going to grab a question from the email here. Let's go. Whoops, I got to mm -hmm. open that up. I got my tablet open. Um, let's see. Um, I have purchased this book. I'm a number in Stats Geek, and I was wondering if there are any thoughts on putting this into electronic form and making a more <laughs> manageable and searchable database. I think there are a lot of other things that could be done from what looks like this was pulled from. You already mentioned that, so I'm not going to finish that thought. Uh, thanks. Hope you can ask this. Eric in the wilds of Vermont. Eric, thanks for being on the edge. Okay. Um, first thing, um, well, while the, the raw data was pulled, we did not publish the raw data right. in this book. Right. All the numbers that are in the book are our computed numbers. Okay. That, I got to make that point very yep, clear. Nope, that's clear. We published <laughs> nothing from those guys. Okay. Um, but we use their data to derive our numbers. Okay. And there's other things we could have done. Uh, we tell people, you know, it's out there. If you want to do something different with it, if you want to figure out the per capita for a particular state or a county like that, uh, we give you the, the square miles. We give you the populations of that state. We didn't break it down to the county. Hey, you can Google that very easily. Um, we made this a tool for you to use to calculate all this stuff. We were only going to take it so far. Now, I've done some other types of calculations myself, and, and there's been a few other uh, organizations have come to me and I've shared small pieces of the database with them for a particular thing. Uh, but we're very, we're being very proprietary about our data. Why didn't we do it in a Kindle book? Oh, you wouldn't believe the hate mail I got about that. Okay. In fact, one really nasty one says you did all this beautiful computational work. This is the third millennium and you put it in paper. Oh, geez. Well, okay. I come from two schools. One, I've got a half a dozen, uh, uh, pads uh, and uh, early Palm Pilots and that kind of thing sitting up in the attic, and I may never get the data that's on them off of them, but they're still finding notes, letters, and uh, and um, sc uh, and scores written by Beethoven or something like that in attics on paper. Okay, paper still is a val valuable medium, and frankly, if you know anything about digital and the fact that people have not been saving and archiving it the way we used to archive paper and like salt mines and things like this, um, we're going to have a very serious problem in the years to come where this uh, maybe a couple of decades worth of stuff is not going to be, there's, it's going to go away. It's We're going to lose. This is going to be a dark age because nobody's protecting and archiving data, not like they did paper. Okay. It's amazing. Now, I mean, you met, you mentioned Kindle. Um, you know, I, I have a tablet. I can't read books at all okay. on a Kindle. Okay. I have to have it in front of me. I have to have, and I like to think it's, you know, the old school oh, person to me. I'm still a library guy. I would never be able to read a book that you've published like this on a Kindle. That's crazy. Well, okay. It's worse than that. Uh, we do have one, we have one Moby copy of it. We had a conversion done. Okay. Mm -hmm. And it looks like hell. Because the charts and graphs, particularly the tables, uh, and there's big, these are big, complicated tables, kind of like you see in on the census pages, that, those kinds of fine print tables. And uh, when you put it down in the Kindle format, I tried to use one, one uh, this my, my tablet, one night on a radio program. And by the time I found the thing I was looking for and then tried to center it up and expand it up so I could read it, um, we were past that moment versus having – having it laying here in my lap, I was able to flip through it like almost instantly and, 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 uh, uh read off what those numbers were. Um, there was two reasons for not making Kindle one. It looked like hell. Okay. Uh, we did try it and it really looked bad. Uh, and it wasn't usable. It really wasn't. The other problem was, um, I published one other book out there on a different topic matter uh, in Kindle, and it was pirated, and I completely lost control of my material, oh, my intellectual wow. property. And so we swore we were not going to make this available electronic. Now, here's the different. Here's the change. Uh, we're working on a project where, remember, I told you all those thousands of cities that were in there from all this, all fifty states. Yep. Okay. Uh, that were spelled wrong, in a lot of cases. Sure. Okay. Okay. Or spelled in half, you know, in capital letters and lowercase letters, or all lowercase letters. You, you you can't search on that kind of stuff. So we've had to go, and I've spent almost a year doing this. You know, about twenty five, thirty minutes every day, going through correcting the spelling on the cities, or at least the case of the spelling. Okay, wow. and uh, one hundred twenty one thousand records. That took time, 
and it's it's an and it makes you cross your eyeballs. It really does. Um, what we're hoping to do is make a document that you look up your state, you look up your county, and there is a breakdown of every single municipality in that county that reported sightings during the sample period. And uh, we came up with a way to possibly do it in Kindle, um, and we think we can publish it both paper and in Kindle. Um, uh, we're we're looking at that. We're we're seriously thinking about publishing this city's directory concept, um, for especially for researchers and things. Sure. Hey, you know, I wanted to ask because we just briefly touched on it when your time in the military when you were stationed in Vietnam. And not that I would think that this would be a topic of conversation, but was it ever bandied about at all in just general conversation? The topics of UFOs, dealing with the fact that you were working right next to pretty cutting edge technology as far as you know flight you know uh, aircraft was concerned uh yeah sometimes sometimes it, uh, you're sitting around listening to some tunes or off duty or something like that and you're sure. listening to some tunes and sometimes somebody gets into a topic matter or something like that and you know maybe brings it up but um uh, it i i think i remember a total of maybe four conversations about the topic matter uh, most people wanted to talk about their girlfriends or cars or, <laughs> you know, or, or their dad's oil business or something, you know, who knows? Uh, it, 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 that topic generally didn't come up. And you had to meet other geeky. Remember, a lot of people were, we were all told in 68 that the people who saw these things or reported these things are, are, are kooks, nuts, and crackpots. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's what Ms. Dr. Condon told everybody. And I'll give you an example on this. Uh, when I was before the, as the, book came out, I reached out to a number of major newspapers in the United States and went to their science, went to their science editors or whoever did that type of thing and made them an offer to give them, share these numbers with them and, and show them how big this was. And most of them, I was met with silence. I did get a return response from, and this is so paradoxical, the science editor from the San Francisco Chronicle. And he said, no, uh, I'll pass. I dropped them back a one-liner, and I said, can you tell me why? And his one-liner back was, the issue of UFOs was settled long ago, was his ah, response. Aha. Okay? Mm. And there's this mentality. Heck, right now, I reached out recently, because I've done the 2016-2017 numbers, okay? And we're not going to publish another book for another, uh, there's a, we like to wait at least three to five years before we do another version, sure, okay? That makes, yeah, that makes sense. And uh, we, I reached out to 20 different press outlets in the top 10 states. And the top 10 states for UFO sightings uh, represent 52% of the sightings in the United States. Mm -hmm. I reached out in their principal cities to major news organizations, and I have been met with silence. This is just in the past two months. Wow. We would have thought that after December 16th there would be more openness to this, but uh, these 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 people are not talking to us about it, or at least they're not talking to me because you know obviously uh, unless I'm unless I'm somebody like Lou Alessandro who's worked for the government or something like this, uh, uh, I don't count. Hmm. I'm just I must just be one of those other kooks and crackpots. In fact, the um, NPR uh, the the PBS sh program on point. Yep, absolutely. Okay, okay. I was asked to be a guest along with Leslie Keen yes. and uh, Ralph Blumenthal, and the three of us were on the show uh, related to the article that they did, okay? And the re only reason I got invited on was when they Googled New York Times and UFOs, that article about my book from a few months before was right there, too. Mm -hmm. OK, so they got got us on and they had me on for probably two minutes in the, in the two hours of the show. OK, I gave them a few major national stats and that was it. And they went back to Leslie Keen. Mm -hmm. Well, I reached out to their senior uh, senior producers and said, hey, how would you like to have a longer conversation about this thing? Because there's a lot there and it's very eye opening. And I think your listenership would really enjoy it. Again, I've been met with, this is just a few months ago, mm -hmm. and I've met with silence. Um, in fact, uh, you're, you're in Buffalo. I reached out to WKBW five times, and WKBW met me with silence. I did reach out to another station in the Buffalo market, 
And they called me back, and they are having a conversation with me. Now, I will know this week whether or not they're going to bother to do this, do a story okay. about the fact that Erie County is like uh, number three in the state of New York. Uh, Erie County is uh, – give me a, give me t- 10 seconds. I got a piece of paper right here, uh, my notes I was using to talk to them. Sure. Uh, Erie County is a big deal because – here it is. Erie County is number three in New York with 169 sightings. Mm-hmm. Okay, I'm sorry, 408 sighting, sightings. Buffalo was number three city in New York State with 169 sightings. Mm-hmm. Erie County is number 64 of over 3,000 United States counties. Hey, well, at least we're good at something. We're in the top. <laughs> you're in the top 100. And Rochester was in similar boat. They're in the number four city here in the state. Their county is number five. Uh, they, they rank in the top 100. I don't have the exact number. I think it's like a 99 or 98, something like that. Sure. Uh, had a similar thing with Syracuse. Syracuse is number five in the in the state. Onondaga County is number eight in the state and Onondaga County happens to be number 152 of 3000 over 3000 counties in the United States. That's huge news. Can't get can't get the uh, news organizations to talk to me. Oh god, those UFO that UFO researcher, she's a nut, <laughs> she's a crackpot, you know. Uh, you know, um, this data speaks for itself. Of course, I did get the answer from one news organization. Well, how do we know it's credible data? Look, I've been in these databases doing my column for five years. And most citing reports that I read, most people were just trying to get it off their chest. And a lot of people say, I didn't believe in this stuff until we saw this thing the other night that did this, that, and the other thing. You know? And 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 that's the kind of thing. And you know, and you can pretty much pick out the hoaxes. OK, but for the most part, most people were just trying to report something they thought felt it was important to report it. it. They wanted to get it off their chest and they saw something incredible. Well, before we go off the air and once we do go off the air, we'll have a quick conversation at the end of the show. You and I can talk about media context. That's not going to be a problem. <laughs> <laughs> Cheryl Costa, my guest here on the edge of the unknown. We're talking UFOs. We got to take our last break of the evening, but we would love to hear from you. The edge of the unknown at gmail.com. Quiet phones tonight, but that's okay. 716 716- 218-3557, whatever is on your mind, give us a yell and we will make sure that it is voiced on this here radio show. Everybody, thanks again for hanging out late on a Sunday evening with me on the edge of the unknown. The best in paranormal talk anywhere. We're back after this, everybody. Stick around. Looking for the best Japanese and Thai cuisine in western New York? Then you have to visit Teton Kitchen at 415 Dick Road in Depew. From appetizers and soups, simple, special, big and fusion style maki, to sushi, sashimi and tempura, you won't get a range of items like this anywhere. Hungry for more? Teton Kitchen offers a full dinner menu and kushiyaki dishes, as well as a huge variety of sake, wine, beer, both domestic and Asian imports. Owner Taka and his bride, Kin, are proud to boast that Teton Kitchen is Yelp's number one rated restaurant in western New York, and they welcome you for lunch or dinner seven days a week with takeout and online ordering available. Visit tetonkitchen.com for their full menu, hours, and online ordering, or call 716-393-3720. Teton Kitchen, 415 Dick Road in Depew. No word in the English language is less convincing than probably. Are you sure we should get matching tattoos on our first date? Sure. Um, we'll probably stay together. Probably? <laughs> it's been 23 minutes since I ate. I can probably swim. Uh, you should wait 30 minutes. Mm, okay, now tell me what to do. Cannonball! Cramp! Oh, I have a cramp. 
I can probably hit the green from here. Probably. Can I get a mulligan? Ready to go? Hey, are you sure you're okay to drive? Yeah, I'm pretty sober. Yeah, I'm probably okay. Probably okay isn't okay, especially when it comes to drinking and driving. If you're drinking, call a cab, a car, or a friend. Buzz driving is drunk driving. A message brought to you by NHTSA and the Ad Council. Hello. What are your fears? Are you badgered by domestic affairs, haunted by ghosts or demons, terrorized by those who would use magic as a weapon, or tormented from within? I can end it. I can stop it. I can cast them away, for I am a sorcerer, and protecting people from these things is what I do. Seek my services at sorcererforhire.com. Or call now for faster service, 206-501-0444. Because time is not on your side. The Hope Project of Western New York is a resource for struggling families often identified as the working poor. We assist individuals who have lost their jobs through no fault of their own, disabled individuals, households with special needs members, victims of domestic violence in transition, and our military families and veterans. The Hope Project provides our members with gently used clothing, household supplies and toys, as well as hygiene and cleaning supplies. We also make available specialty items like prom dresses and Halloween costumes. These items are provided at zero cost to our members. How can you help? By donating items at our storefront. 4545 Transit Road in Williamsville, New York, inside the Eastern Hills Mall. Store hours, Monday 10 to 2, Tuesday 11 to 2, Wednesday 10 to 8, Thursday 10 to 2, and Saturday 10 to 2. Closed on all school holidays. Clothing should be contemporary, free of stains and tears, and household items must be in good condition and in working order. We also accept grocery and department store gift cards, as well as monetary donations. You can also help out by becoming a volunteer. For more information, visit our website at thehopeprojectofwny.org or call us at 716-810-9156. The Hope Project of Western New York. Dignified help for those in need. Hi, this is Paul Bartholomew, and you're listening to The Edge of the Unknown with Mark Henry. And into our last segment we go here on The Edge of the Unknown with my guest Cheryl Costa this evening. Thanks for hanging out with me, and of course thanks to Cheryl for being here. We're having a fun time talking stats in UFOs, and man, a lot of numbers have been thrown around. We're going to focus on New York State, but I have neglected the email bag. We need to get to a question or two here before we wrap things up. And let's do that. Let's do that. I want to go to this one because this is a gent who says he's from, and I hope I pronounced this correctly, uh, Hereford, England. Hereford, England. Pete writes in and says, hello, I know Mark's feelings about a lot of the television stuff that involves the paranormal, but I wanted to ask Cheryl what she thinks of the UFO on her shows. Thanks, Pete in Hereford, England. Pete, thanks for being on the edge. Um, they have to make it entertaining. And unfortunately, I sometimes think they they sacrifice good uh, <laughs> good airtime for, uh, you know, and good good research for making it entertaining. Um, I've seen some very bad UFO hunter shows. I've seen some, a couple of good ones. So uh, the jury's still out. Uh, I'll give an example. One of the things we're thinking about doing is doing a thing called UFO Road Show, where we go to a particular town where we already know there's a cluster going on in, say, a particular county, and we'll we'll rent a VFW hall or something like this, and we'll give one of my presentations to uh, the population there, and then we'll get a lot of people on camera to tell us about, share their sightings, kind of like a grassroots disclosure project. Yeah, that sounds and neat. That, 
that's something we've been proposing, and uh, we've got some evidence to suggest it might be a good uh, good thing. Unfortunately, some of the TV producers want to jazz it up more, mm-hmm. and and uh, can't make it can't make it simple and honest and just plain folksy, and that's a shame. No, and I agree. I am uh, the, the actual the UFO hunter shows. I've only seen a couple of them. The one guy that's always wearing the sunglasses, I forget. I think that's the UFO hunters. I, I don't necessarily have an issue with, with the investigation because burns. UFOs is it burns. <laughs> that's it. it yeah. It's a little bit different than the other stuff. I, I'm highly critical of the ghost hunter. The Bigfoot one I'm not really concerned with. I really don't watch that show that much. But I, 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 I sit on the fence. So, Pete, I appreciate you asking that question. I want to clarify the UFO investigations and what MUFON does or what anybody else does is a little bit different than setting up in a haunted place and seeing what they're going to capture. So anyway, we'll, we'll move on from there, but well, no, you know, uh, let me let bring up a point on that. Sure. I, I had a producer call me out of New York back when the book first came out and he wanted to try to use the statistics to basically try and predict a, pl- a, a, co- a county where they could expect to set up a camera and, and, and virtually see something every night. Right. Is what he wanted to do. And I said, yeah, but you might see something. But are you expecting to see uh, a major craft hovering out there over the trees? Or, or is that what you're expecting? Because most of these things are not that overt, you know. And uh, no, that's what he wanted. Well, eventually what he, he got tired of talking to me and he went out and he's, he's out chasing cattle mutilations. So uh, that had, you know, you know, you know what they say in media, if it bleeds, it leads, you know, so. Sure. Well, yeah. I mean, honestly, it's that it's that wow factor. It's that excitement. And, you know, it, uh, that's what I always tell everybody. Most of the people who I have on that are serious paranormal investigators, they'll say, you know, 99 percent of the time, it's not what you think it is. <laughs> it's a lot more research. And it, the whiz bang stuff you see on TV is hairspray and production. Anyway, let's um uh, before we actually we'll, we'll grab this one, too. Um, This one comes from Bill in Camillus. Bill says, great show. Outside of the pen and paper work you are mired in, how much field work do you do for, and do you work with the local or state chapters of MUFON? Bill, thanks for listening. I appreciate you being on the edge. Okay. Um, actually, I'm, what I, I, I don't t- – <laughs> this is a running joke. We're a couple old ladies here, you know, and the flavor uh, – my, my attitude about field work um, – I don't st- I don't go out there and put my shoes in the cow patties. I don't like getting caught in barbed wire, and I hate ticks. <laughs> uh, and 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 not everybody does field work. Some of the best work that's done out there is done in the research library, that type of thing. Um, uh, one of the best pieces of research ever done about the Roswell area of uh, region uh, of Roswell era of sightings. See Roswell spent one day on the front page and it was it and it fell off the front page but there were thousands of sightings during that june and july of 1947 that most people don't know about Mm -hmm. okay and uh and that kind of research was done by an actor who was a part of a road touring company and he had his afternoons free because he performed at night. So he would go into libraries all over the country and go through their morgues of newspapers from the June through July era of 1947 and make notes and write down things. If he could get copies, he got copies. And he wrote this fantastic paper back in the sixties about just how big what was going on during that period of time was most people have no clue how big it was. And we're talking some pretty big numbers right here in New York state. You're from yep. New York. I'm from New York. You just mentioned it right before we ended the break or we had to break for the break. That makes sense. Um, the, the rank of Erie County and across all of these thousands of other counties in the country, they're in the top 100, pretty close to being in the top 50 Let's talk mm-hmm. about the other numbers that we can throw around as far as reports that uh, you compiled that happened right here in New York State. Okay, uh, let's. I'm not going to give you the national s- stats for these uh, New York State counties, sure. but I will give you their ranking in New York, and you can pretty much extrapolate how high up they are nationally. Got it. Um, Suffolk County is ground zero for UFOs. Uh, that's uh, the far end, of, the Montauk Point end of Long Island. Hmm. Who 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 could guess that one, huh? Uh, five hundred in in two thousand one to two thousand fifteen, five hundred fifty four sightings. 
uh, New York County, which is Manhattan, and I make this distinction. I broke Manhattan down to their individual counties, or not Manhattan, but New York City. Uh, the, okay, so New York County, Manhattan had 426. Erie County had 352. Nassau County, the other end of Long Island, Long Island coming back towards the city, uh, is 276. Uh, Monroe County, that's Rochester, uh, 236. Kings County, New York, again, we're down in New York City area, uh, 225. Queens County, New York, that's Queens, New York, uh, is 210. There was an unknown county of 203 sightings. Onondaga sure. County, which is um, uh, this, around the Syracuse area, we're a hot spot in central New York. Mm -hmm. uh, we had 161. And in Westchester County, which is down north of the city, New York City, and they had 153. And then we can go to shapes if you'd like to know the top shapes in New York State. You know, I and this sounds odd, and I, it's obviously something we probably can't discuss tonight, but while we're, I'm listening to all these counties and these locations across the state, I would love to know the socioeconomics overall of each of these counties as well. I would like to even delve into that. Maybe somebody out there has got the time to do that, but I would love to see all that. So, I mean, I'm not a huge stats guy, but I think that that's also very interesting is who these people are, what do they do for a living, uh, you know, because I think, again, a lot of times when we talk about these documentaries, what we see in the national news is it's some guy in the middle of nowhere who says something landed in his cornfield. Now, the, the counties that you just mentioned all do have areas of agriculture, but they also have pretty big hubs of, of you know, populations where it's not that that portrait of the dumb hick who's just making something up or is confused about something that he saw. Okay, yeah. Well, I'll give you a good example. Everybody thinks uh, you have to go outside uh, in the country to see these things. Remember the famous case of L Linda Quartile uh, in New York City. She was levitated out of her 10th floor apartment back back in the early 70s, along with two alien beings and sucked up into a, a, a flying saucer. And it was witnessed by a couple of New York City cops as well as a security team for a U.N. Uh, representative. And this is about three o'clock in the morning when this occurred. It's a very famous uh, abduction case. Right. So, I mean, that's right right there. That's what we're talking about is it, it's not just rural areas and it's not just I, I don't know. I find the whole thing fascinating, but I would love to see a breakdown of that. But that would be a whole different book, I'm sure. So. Right. Well, let me give you a couple of stats here Please, about New yeah, York. Go ahead. Uh, during a 15 year period, New York State had one th uh, five thousand one hundred forty one sightings. And we ranked number six in the country in, in the 2001 uh, to 2015 time frame. Now, I remember talking to my baristas when I was working at the bank. We were compiling these numbers here at home. And uh, I'd come in on Monday morning to get my my big, serious uh, dark roast coffee. And the barista knew I was working on the book. He says, wow, what we what state did you crunch this weekend? And one particular weekend, uh, Monday morning, I said, oh, we did New York. He said, what was it like? I said, number six in the country. And it's like 5,141. And this little lady behind me tapped me on the shoulder. Did you say New York State had over 5,000 UFO sightings? What time frame? And I said, in the last 15 years. And we watched the color drain from her face. We had to help her to a chair. And she said, how? We never hear about this thing in the news. And I said, yeah, that's the problem. You never hear about this thing in the news. We average 450 to 500 a year here in New York. Now, Nobody tells us. <laughs> now, right, and, and, hmm, which brings up uh, the the conflict that you're going not the conflict, but the challenge that you have right now of trying to to talk about this. Is it the fact that the news media that you've approached they're not necessarily interested in it because it is just numbers and they're looking for something more like that gentleman that you said wants to go out in the country and just point a camera at the sky and hope to see something. Well, yes and no. Um, I'll give you one example. I called the editor at the Times Union newspaper in Albany. Yep. Okay. Got him on the phone, talked to him, gave him a pitch. Okay. I'm, I'm, a good, I'm good with the pitch. Okay. And I said, I've got a really great story here for you. If you're interested, we've done some incredible research. And he says, well, just a second. He held the phone back away from his mouth, hollered out to his news team. 
hey, I got somebody here who wants to do a story with us about UFOs. Anybody interested? The whole place broke into laughter and he hung up. Really? Okay. Now, I talked to another news editor and he said, look, I work in such and such number market. I work in number 103 market. I want to get a job in number 102, possibly one, uh, maybe someday get into the 90s. If I do a stupid story like UFO, like UFOs, I'll never get there. Hmm. Okay. Hmm. Instead of telling the truth, they want to just tell a story and promote their career. And amazingly enough, this is, as they say, this is the greatest story never told. I've had mail from other journalists telling me, me writing my column, you'll never write for anybody else again. Nobody will ever take you seriously. Amazingly enough, I'm getting published every place, and I'm not only just writing UFO <laughs> articles. I'm writing for 55 type 55 plus magazines and all kinds of cool stuff. In fact, I'm getting ready to start writing a column for a state volunteer firefighter magazine. You know, I mean, so I'm a good writer. This just, just happens to be what I work on right now that, that I get paid at at this newspaper. You know, what, what we an, took it very seriously. What an interesting flip flop where we're talking a long time ago or not even that long time ago, not too long ago. It was the kooks, weirdos and goofballs who reported this stuff. Now those people are actually reporting things, right? Mm -hmm. But the people that they want to be talking to um, don't want to talk to them or come up with another reason because they don't want to be seen as the kooks, goofballs, and weirdos unless it suits their purpose. I just find that interesting. Nobody wants to be the uh, – there's an old line, uh, nobody wants to be the saucer guy. Right. <laughs> That's one of the problems we've got in the government. Um, uh, we gave two copies, a copy of this, this book to Senator Schumer – office and to Senator Gillibrand's office. I put a four and a half page letter with it. Okay. And couldn't get an answer out of, out of Gillibrand's office at all. Schumer's office talked to me. Said, well, we, we lose mail in the congressional mail room. I said, Oh really? You, so you think you lost my letter down in the congressional mail room? Oh yeah, it, it does happen. I said, but mine had a two and a half pound book stapled to it. So you're telling me I can't communicate with my elected representative that somebody in the congressional mailroom is pilfering um, material that's intended for my elected representative. And boy, did I get silenced. OK. Wow. Wow. And they did ask me. Uh, uh, Schumer staff did ask me for another copy of the letter, which I printed out for them. And then they also asked me for a copy of the book, which I did. And I hand, literally hand carried it to representatives here. They sent it down in their uh, special mail bag. And most congressional letters, if you send them, hey, I want to talk to you about my benefit, veterans benefits. You'll get a letter back in four to eight weeks, typically. OK. It's been over a year and a half and I've tried to call them. Now they won't even take my phone calls. They won't even answer my email. No kidding. Wow. Wow. That's disheartening quite frankly. But I wrote the, the last letter. I, in fact, I wrote an open letter to Senator Schumer in my column a few months back. Okay. My editor published it, an open letter to Senator Schumer. And I call out all the issues that, Hey, our military is controlled by our civilian government. You are my elected representative. This is what's going on with UFOs. Here are some of the simple stats, just in New York State alone, and oh, by the way, the greater country, some very simple stats, and said this needs to be looked at because it represents, and I don't like saying that the, the UFOs and the aliens that are flying them are, or the interdimensional beings that are flying them are, are uh, hostile. But sometimes that's the only way you can get some of these people in government to react. And I said, this possibly represents a clear and present danger. Okay? I got a huge amount of mail on it, supportive advice, but never a peep out of Senator Schumer's office. Nobody wants to be, nobody wants to get painted with that brush. Okay? Mm -hmm. And that's the problem. I even asked them for a quote when the uh, J D uh, December 16th article broke in the New York Times, the Washington Post and Politico and all those places, I went to their press people in Washington on the phone and I said, I want a quote. Okay, nothing. Why do you think someone at such a higher end or that is even more visible than someone that does mostly issues with New York State, would have no problem talking. And we see this, and I don't want to talk about Leslie Kane's book, but she does mention it because there are a lot of people in her books that do talk about this freely. Why is it 
that outside of the pat, you know, the fact that they don't want to be, you know, painted with a brush, but there are people who don't seem to care, who are in much greater positions of power than those who seem to be more concerned about this. I don't know. I don't know. I mean, uh, a big Mr. Bigelow didn't care on 60 Minutes. Mm-hmm. But then again, I reached out to 60 Minutes sh- sometime after that and said, like, I'm, I'm the national stats lady here. And I said, here's an article from New York Times. This is a sample of stats. I'll give you a copy of the book. Simply start. To, please talk to me. I've got something amazing for you to know. Silence. And I wrote them like five times. Nothing. You've got to be the right person. Okay. They must not see a level of credibility with me or importance with me with something bigger to lose, so to speak. I think that's what it was. I think that's what shocked them. A guy who's the CEO of some major company, you know, he has theoretically everything to lose by admitting that he believes in little green men, you know, that's not, you know, I think that's what their mentality is. And it's a damn shame. It really is because, um, I had a lot of people reach out to me when the book first came out and after the New York Times wrote their article. You wouldn't believe some of the people who call me uh, to talk about this stuff. But was it government? No. Well, wait a minute. In one case, it was. There's an office that supplies research material to the congressional offices. Not, I'm not talking the Library of Congress, but mm-hmm. there's a congressional research office. Sure. They reached out. And got a copy. They wanted to know exactly where we could get it and if we plan to come out with any other editions and such. And we know for a fact they bought several copies of it. Interesting. So they want it on their shelves, but nobody wants to talk about it. Yeah. Coffee table book. <laughs> yeah, well, we ran into that in a couple of places. Uh, uh, I, I submitted it to a, um, a regional um, book contest in the nonfiction category. And I got all this nice, lovely mail back from the judges who did not pick it for that category, but told me that they they have it prominently displayed, you know, giving me that booby prize of saying, oh, it's prominently displayed on my coffee table. OK, thanks. <laughs> that doesn't really help what I was trying to do there, but I appreciate the effort. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I want to grab another email here. Uh, please, please. Let's do the let's do those. Yeah, sure. Hang on. Um, come on. Open. There we go. Um. Hi, thanks for finally getting back to UFOs. Love the show, so show more love to the UFO crowd. All right. Uh, A comment more than a question. As we continue to learn more about the world around us and certainly know more about our capabilities as, as humans and our technological aspirations and boundaries, we are beginning to weed out UFO reports that are likely man made objects from the more genuine unidentified objects in our skies. Would Cheryl agree or disagree with that line of thinking? David in Buffalo. David, thanks for writing in. I appreciate it. David, in my book, um, I, again, it's the needle in the haystack thing. Uh, I, I, after talking to all my top UFO uh, research guys from MUFON, and I ran the range with several of these. These were these are star team type guys uh, at the, one of the MUFON conventions. I know these some of these guys on first name basis, and. Uh, we came up with a number of somewhere it's on the conservative side of 4% and 7% are, are, are that unknown, genuine article type of thing. Okay. So in our book, we, we took the number of 7%. Okay. So of that, of that seven, of that, um, 121,000 sightings, 7%. So, uh, let's take a look at that real quick. Let me give you a number here. Okay. Okay, 121,000 times 0.07. Okay, that gives us about 8,470. We'll divide that over 15 years. That gives us about 564 sightings a year that are probably something very genuine, something very special. And if you divide that by 12 months, that gives us about 50 of these events uh, a month. So theoretically, we're having 50 major something came down from the heavens events a month in this country. That's about one per state. And if you wanted to proportion it based on the, the numbers that people, you know, what ranking the states are, 
Uh, some states maybe have more than others, but that's saying we've got about 50 of these things happening a month on average if you use that 7% number. And the the investigator guys all seem to feel that number between 4 and 7% was a really good number. And that's what I keep trying to tell people. These are, Something big, shiny comes down from the sky. That's a biblical event in my book. Mm-hmm. Okay? Right. And, yeah, there's a lot of stuff out there flying, airplanes, uh, uh, uh uh, drones, all kinds of stuff, a lot of misidentifications and things like this. But when it really comes down to the metal, if you really want to be conservative about this, the best numbers are around five, uh, four to seven percent. Most of the investigators were saying about seven percent, and uh, that comes down to numbers that there's something still amazing happening every year on the order of about fifty a month or more. Uh, so. Um, there's still a lot out there to investigate. And if you want to become a UFO uh, investigator, uh, get a hold of the state director, for, uh, Sam Falvo. You can find him on the MUFON site there under uh, chapters and tell him you're interested in being a, a UFO investigator. And he will invite you to a class they're going to offer out late summer, early fall. They're going to offer like a, a weekend class and, and, and get you certified to become a MUFON field investigator. He's lo- the, the, the team in New York State is looking for new blood. Yeah, Sam's so, great. Yeah, Sam's been on the show. He's he's Sam's terrific. He was he's a great guy. guy. I like he him a lot. Certainly is. Hey, Cheryl Costin, my guest here. Outside of the column that we can see in uh, the SyracuseNewTimes.com, where else can people find you? We never really touched on that, and I want to make sure people know where they can look for you. <laughs> Okay, the col- okay, first thing about the column, it's at the SyracuseNewTimes.com. Uh, when you go to the navigation bar, uh, you can find the thing for blogs. You click on, uh, hover over that. You'll see a drop down for New York skies, and they label it also the UFO column. And if you go to an article, look at whatever the current article is. And if you go down to the lower left-hand corner, you'll see a tag there for New York New York skies, you click on that and it puts you into an archive page of probably the last four and a half years worth of articles. So if you really want to do a lot of serious reading, the articles run anywhere from 500 to a thousand words typically. Um, Okay. Where, where else am I? I really don't have a website for this stuff, Mm -hmm. but I do, I am a talk show host and I talk the paranormal over on KCOR digital network. I'm on Tuesdays, midday show. uh, It's uh, two o'clock Eastern time on Tuesdays. Uh, The show is called cosmic questions. And the idea for doing it midday is because all these shows are usually late night and we've had a lot of mail from people saying, but I can't stay up that late or I got to work, you know. So um, when I proposed the, uh, going back to my 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 cosmic question roots or my paranormal roots, I used to do a show like this in D.C. Uh, for about four years down there called, uh, called The X Factor. And I was the stop for everybody who was peddling a book on the paranormal, you know, mm-hmm, and uh, <laughs> it was a lot of fun, but it was on a small station, a small FM station. So here we are doing it again on a digital platform. It's technically worldwide. It's got worldwide access and uh, we're having a lot of fun. And again, Tuesdays, uh, Eastern time, 2 p.m. It's 11 uh, a.m. Pacific time. You can extrapolate out the rest of the times there. But uh, I've got a really interesting lineup of guests and not the ones who have been on all the regular show, the other paranormal shows, because I've got I've got deeper roots than most of those folks do. It's true. You know, I, I, I the one rule that I have, I don't do any of the mainstream. I don't do any filmmakers. I don't do any of that stuff that I, I pride myself and I'm glad that you do, too. I want to talk the real faces of the paranormal, of which you are one. And I really appreciate you being on tonight. Thanks so much for your time. Have me on it. Uh, have me on again in the near future, sure. and we'll talk about the paranormal from the context of magic, um, uh, connection to the divine, and this new cosmic consciousness that seems to be just going through a wave of people, particularly with the experiencers right now. It's a huge deal because there seems to be some kind of cosmic awakening going on. And I saw a talk about it this weekend, and it was parallel to what I've been observing, and it's worth talking about. I would love to have you back on if you would be so kind as to do so. Anytime. Just call me. Perfect. Cheryl Costa, my guest here on The Edge of the Unknown. That's going to wrap it up for us. But everybody, get out there and check out this book, UFO Sightings, Desk Reference, United States of America, 
2001 to 2015. You can find it at Amazon.com. Again, Cheryl Costa, my guest, thank you so much for being on, and we will do it again. And I will see you guys in a couple of weeks. I want to thank everybody for listening. Thanks for everybody who had questions for us this week. Thanks to Mark Nyan of Houston, Texas for the music bumps. Everybody, you can contact me at any time during the week, theedgeoftheunknown at gmail.com. If you have a question, comment, or guest uh, suggestion, please shoot it to me there. Everybody, be excellent to each other. Check out my YouTube page, Uncle Josh's True Scary Stories. Have a great week. Enjoy yourselves, and we'll see you soon here on The Edge of